Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on ThinkTech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and today's episode is the International Court of Justice Initiative Action for the Advisory Opinion at the World Court. And we're here live in The Hague, focusing on advocacy by Pacific Islands at the Peace Palace and looking at the VACA voyage to navigate the UN. And we're very fortunate to be joined by the World Youth for Climate Justice. Mert, thank you so much for taking time. Have an amazing two days in The Hague. Thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, and indeed, it's amazing to have met, met uh, finally met you here in The Hague. Uh, and I'm here on behalf, as Joshua said, on, on behalf of World Youth for Climate Justice. Uh, it, is, it is a global movement uh, that has young people on different fronts from all around the globe. I'm uh, based in The Hague, uh, so I'm from the European front. We have fronts in uh, South America, obviously the Pacific, where we started, uh, uh, Asia, and you name it. We're, we're all around the globe, and we're trying to grow as a movement. And hopefully one day we'll also have a front on uh, Hawaii. Thank you so much. Just wondering, like, as youth, what inspired you to be involved for climate justice initially? And then what are you doing these days on a daily level to combat the climate crisis? Yeah, amazing question. So um, I, I, let's, let's start with the first question, like how I came into climate justice and how it started out for me. Uh, I think um, being a Dutch citizen, being a Dutchie, I would say, uh, the brunt of the rising tides has always been a sort of an element uh, in which we were uh, faced upon from a young age. So when I was younger, uh, we, it was very normal to start learning how to swim at the age of four and so on. So uh, the water was always a sort of, we're always in fight with water. That's how we started out, right? So uh, that, that's the first basic steps of every Dutch citizen's life. You start out with no, learning how to swim. Uh, but later on, you, you find out that, but wait a minute, why are we fighting this water? And, and why is it rising on other places at the same time? I mean, uh, we are part of a delta in the Netherlands, so it, it makes sense that we are living on borrowed land, literally. Uh, so for our situation, it's not per se only uh, the rising tides due to climate change, but also mainly due because of our poor location. Um, but in other, like on small island developing states, for example, you see that because of the brunt of the climate crisis, uh, these islands are literally drowning because of uh, our, our, our consumer pro, like our, 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 the ways in which we consume. So um, it just dawned upon me that, wow, that reality that we have here is not because of choice, but it's by design, uh, by a faulty system. And I wanted to find out how in order, like, how could I stop that? And what is the tools, what, 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 what tools do I have to, to prevent that? Uh, what do you do on a daily basis and what do you yeah. focus on? Yeah, thank you. So uh, what we do on a daily basis is, um, is it's, it's difficult to pinpoint like what we actually do every single day. It's obviously different, um, but the first, Two, the first main things that, that pop up into mind uh, are um, tirelessly advocating and working together with other young people uh, to create a common voice. And that sounds a little bit strange if you don't know what I mean, but it, what, we're trying, what I'm trying to say is uh, we're trying to create a story based upon how the climate crisis is impacting human rights. And you do that by educating others, by showing and by telling them how uh, we are trying to combat this with this initiative at the ICJ. Um, it, it is, um, it's, a, it, it's, it's easy to, to talk about it, but it's also, diff it's, the difficult part in this all is how to make it understandable for everyone to join in. Not everybody is a law student, not everybody has a law degree. So you want to join forces because in the end, the climate crisis is a, co is a common crisis we have, we face, like the same, we, we all face that in, in the future. So in order to get all people on board on the same train, you need to have them, or and to say in the, in, the, in the WACA terms, all aboard on the same boat, obviously, uh, you need to make it more accessible for everyone. So like lower the threshold. And I would say that that's a daily basis, a daily challenge that, I, that I'm trying to, uh, yeah, trying to achieve in order to make sure that the climate justice that we do on a daily basis is more understandable for everyone. Uh, and also obviously like being conscious with your environment. So uh, live in, in harmony with your environment is very important, I would say. And uh, that can be, like obviously it can be showing respect to the lands you walk on and live on but so like keeping your streets clean obviously but it can also mean helping out your neighbors in in finding for them finding solutions for them in how to uh for example like uh get rid of uh, i would just say like some pests they have in the garden like on a on a friendly way like in a climate friendly way a climate neutral way that can be a thing 
uh, in, in, like act locally and inspire globally is also what I uh, always like to say. No, oh, that's great. And you really do make the connection where you can see up at growing up in Hawaii, of course, we spend time with the ocean as well, and we respect nature. And yeah. you're there in the Hague, and you grew up also by the ocean. So we all have this common island earth, as you said, and we're all aboard the same baka or yeah. this canoe going in the right direction. So that's exciting. And when I think about the way you shared it, it's very personable. And that was the conference. So we were at the International Court of Justice, and we're looking at climate change and international law. And the main area we're looking at is the promise of an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. We had four panels. One of the panels I thought was so exciting that maybe you could share also, because people don't know about the, your agenda case. Maybe you could share with yeah. us about the agenda case and the human rights turn and how yeah. climate litigation is now playing this new role. And we can go through a couple of the panels and some of those highlights for our audience who weren't yeah. able to be at the Peace Palace. Yeah, so uh, the Urgenda case or Urgenda case uh, is a Dutch uh, litigation case uh, created by uh, a group of, of stakeholders. And it was actually open for every citizen to join in to become a stakeholder, uh, which, which was a case against the government. And they basically said that the government was failing to meet its climate ambitions. And they used uh, articles two and eight of the European um, uh, Human Rights Convention. Um, Convention, thank you. Yeah, I'm a, I should know this because I wrote my thesis on this for a part, but not, but thank you. Uh, so like they used Article 2 and 8. And uh, the basis was that like they eventually won. They went through uh, like in uh, they went through like the local um, local courts, then like to the uh, to, to like the higher courts, and then eventually at the highest Supreme Court in the Netherlands, and they won. Uh, and that case made it possible, like it showed that litigation actually was a tool to enforce climate action from our government. Um, so whenever you mention the word agenda within the, the, the square kilometer of the Hague of like the political heart of the Netherlands, uh, you'll see a lot of politicians sweating profoundly because uh, it's still a traumatic experience to see that like the courts are becoming more active in actively saying that the government should uphold their promises. Uh, you cannot make promises that you did, that you did not deliver on. That's, that's just not how it works because uh, let's face it, the climate crisis is in such, uh, it's, it's in, the, the, the state of our earth is in such terrible state right now that we just cannot accept it to wait any longer. And we need to like take that into hands right now. Uh, so that's how the litigation case, the Urgenda case was so groundbreaking because it showed that the courts were open uh, and were, were a possibility for, for everyone basically to make it sure that our governments are accountable for their emissions and are accountable for their lack of climate action. And Hrenda, as you said, it, it is profound. And it also inspired more people to use human rights lens for the liberation of humanity to protect our planet. And are there other cases that are also along the lines that people could be aware of related to human rights and, and climate litigation that you could share with some of our audience? Mm, so there are multiple cases in other European countries that, that basically sprung off of uh, the Urgenda case. Like it basically created a sort of a, uh, I would say, yeah, it, like it's it ignited a few sparks all around the globe. Um, the, the the thing is though, that the reasoning behind like the reason why they use Articles Two and Eight of the European Convention, the Human Rights Convention, was because um, that convention is actually saying like to make it sure that there's a ha livable like that, that the, the government has a responsibility like to create a livable uh, uh, atmosphere, like a livable livable place for for their citizens, and it is a very open to interpretation uh, norm, right? So uh, it's not defined very, very clearly by the courts. So uh, that also like leaves it open for interpretation. But at the same time, it goes to show that the courts do not accept this less, this um, openness or like vagueness that's in the law to be used against the people that are suffering from the climate crisis. So in a way, it is a very um, yeah, I would say transformative position that the court has taken and the courts are taking right now because they see that, like, in all honesty, what would be the next step? But the people are trying to, people are seeking for the court because that's their final straw. Um, you, I would say that, like, this is the final step, the final legal mechanism that we have as activists and young people and, and also the elderly, obviously, um, before 
uh, yeah, before there's no the other option left. So like, this is our way of saying, listen, we want to think within the system that we have right now. We want to think, uh, like we want to change the system that we are currently having, but we can only do it like through peaceful ways and through ways that we've created in the law and let us do it, like allow us to be peaceful and allow us to, to use these methods and these mechanisms that we have uh, and give us the rights that we so universally uh, hold dear. No, it's a really good point because we are taking the world's biggest problem to the to highest, the highest sport. Sport. So it, it's quite crucial. Yeah. And it reminds me of panel two that was chaired by Mamadou. I think yeah. that bringing climate change before an international courts and tribunals, there was some really good analysis from Cambridge and Singapore and looking at the UN, yeah. Law of the Sea. Maybe expand yeah. on that a bit to share some of the, the kernels of knowledge that we can all gain as you said, bringing it to these highest yeah. bodies. Yeah, so uh, Mamadou uh, is actually, <laughs> he's one of my uh, lecturers at the Light University. So that's very interesting. Like uh, it was amazing. And this panel was a very good one too. Uh, but indeed you see different uh, legal, uh, like you see, you have, you have different courts, right? So you have the International Court of Justice, you have the International Tribunal of the Law of the Seas. Um, but why we focus with this campaign on the ICJ in particular, is that the ICJ is, as you said it before, Joshua, the highest court. Every single member state that is a part of the UN respects and recognizes the judgments of the ICJ. When the ICJ says something, it basically becomes the law. That's how you should, that's how people, that's how uh, governments deem it. But an advisory opinion is a special tool. It's, it's not binding in the traditional way. It means that whenever the court gives an advisory opinion, which can only be requested by the member states themselves uh, through a process that we're currently are, are unrolled rolled in, but I'll tell you later. Um, so it means that like, whenever the court gives such an opinion, um, it just is an advice, as, as it says, an advisory opinion. But at the same time, this advice has a lot of legal and moral authority, which it carries with it. So, for example, whenever uh, I like imagine we, we also like say with our campaign, it's not uh, uh, when, uh, it's not if, but when we get the advisory opinion. Um, so, like imagine a couple of years when we have the advisory opinion, we'll go to a national court. Yeah. So imagine you're in, in Germany, for example, you can actually prove to the court and you can show them this is what the UN highest court has said. They have deemed and they've ruled that climate change is actually affecting our human rights. So um, it goes to show that it provides a legal fundament and a legal basis for so many cases and so many future litigation uh, that the International Court of Justice is the only route for this biggest problem that we have. And uh, therefore, that's why uh, the, the campaign is focusing on the ICJ, because uh, the ICJ alone has this international universal recognition of authority and um, yeah, the, 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 the legal power, which it carries with it. No, no, it's a really good point. And so when we see those lawyers and, you know, people who have done the strategy, that was the deepest yeah. part of people looking why different bodies should be pursued. So in a way, it was telling us, as we're all getting in this vodka, let's know where we're headed. And a lot of people yeah. talked about the star compass. So in a way, we at least have the best, sort of navigators the master navigators sharing with us like we in hawaii had before we sailed hokulea to tahiti and around the world we had mao share with us that knowledge and they were able to then in a way provide some guidance of which one we should pursue and how that be done and then that really puts us to you know where we are today today was I'll, I'll quote you, hey, go, oh, let's, let's go, right? go. So most yes. people don't know what an, an advisory opinion is from the ICJ. Do you want to share everyone a bit about the power of the ICJ and an advisory opinion? Yeah, of course. So uh, for example, like a very good, uh, like a very known example is um, the ICJ uh, nuclear, uh, like, the WHO advisory opinion on the nuclear use of nuclear weapons, for example. And um, fun, <laughs> ironically, I would say the ICJ, uh, the, the International Court of Justice, 
did not deem the usage of nuclear weapons as uh, illegal. So like it was not under international law uh, uncalled for to use nuclear weapons, uh, which obviously it was not a unanimous opinion because there was also a dissenting opinion. And uh, this is the most famous, I mean, every law student know, knows that, every law student knows this, uh, public international law student, I should say, knows this dissenting opinion from uh, Judge Weir Mantri. He was a Sri Lankan judge. And he actually wrote, uh, I mean, it was like 14 pages dissenting opinion on why he deemed the usage of nuclear weapons uh, to be uh, uh, like to be not respecting any human rights whatsoever at any given point. There was no just justification to use nuclear weapons according to the judge. And you see that even though that it was not a unanimous opinion, it was still a dissenting opinion, it is still being used to this day by scholars, by students in their reports, in their judge, like in their, uh, I mean, judgments as well sometimes, but like it's, it's still being used even though there was a dissenting opinion uh, because these 15 lawyers, uh, 15 judges that are sitting in the court um, are the highest judges of them all. So they have that power and they can actually influence jurisprudence, they can influence the public debate, and they can also um, uh, influence the international debate that we have, have on certain topics. So that is why uh, the outcome of the advisory opinion itself is, of course, very important. But the road towards that advisory opinion is also very important. And that's why we're stressing, for example, that when we're at the court, we need to have young people to be vocal. We need to have indigenous voices to be heard within the chambers of the court. Because it cannot be any longer that um, we're only like that, that we're only standing on the outside. Like I mean, you were there too, Joshua, right? There's a lot of security, and before you can enter the international court, like there's a large fence. We want to have young people and Indonesian people to be there at the court's grounds when we have the proceedings there, because in the end, it is also their human rights we're fighting, we're standing for, we're fighting for, and I think that that element should become more known. It is not about statistics. It's not about only numbers. No, we're talking about human lives. And uh, quite frankly, right now we're, we're on a path which is a death sentence for a lot of indigenous people and a lot of people that are living on small island developing states. And we cannot accept that. We should not accept that. We should never allow that to happen. Um, so I, I, yeah, in, in that way, like the ICJ is, in my opinion, the only court that has this unique role and unique position that we um, need to use to the fullest. And great to look at the dissenting opinion. Also, the excitement of the panel three was the experience of everyone there had really brought an advisory opinion before the court, before, and everyone in the audience. It was some of the greatest legal minds ever assembled by the Blue Law Ocean, bringing that together, bringing the different Leiden University. It was exciting yeah. to see the activists, the artists, the advocates all pulling out their creative campaign tools and techniques to see what is possible. And that panel yeah. was exciting because it was chaired by Vanuatu, who yeah. will be the one that is formally launching the campaign for an advisory opinion at the UN General Assembly. Can you maybe share? how this campaign got started by you yeah yeah so um it's it's good to know uh, like it all started out about young people in the pacific and uh it, it started at the university of the south pacific in uh, the pacific like in the pacific region obviously um and uh, it was during a class of public international law i believe where uh, justin who was a, was the uh, teacher of uh, some of the students solomon is one of the main uh, leading forces behind the pacific island students fighting climate change he showed and he told them about um, uh, about an advisory opinion attempt in 2011 or 2012. I'm not I'm not sure which got uh, basically torpedoed by the United States. Um, so there was no, because the International Court of Justice, good to know, was the is the is the only UN body that has never spoken about climate change. The only body, and we're in 2022 right now. So the climate crisis is, has been known for quite some time now. Um, so it started out there with these young students saying, you know what, to hell with it, we'll try it again. We need to have our rights to be heard. We, we cannot live on a planet because we're literally drowning here. So they went to uh, the COP, uh, COP25 in Madrid, Spain. Um, and they met 
up with young students from uh, Vietnam, uh, from, the, from the Philippines, from the Netherlands, from Aruba. They came together and they said, let's do this. Let's bring this. Uh, let's, let's make sure that we can actually take another shot at bringing this to the International Court of Justice. And it was so interesting because uh, Vanuatu stepped up and showed leadership and said, you know what, we will present this and we will bring this forward at the United Nations. Um, because it's good to know that only member states can do this, right? So uh, when Watson said, we'll do this, we'll show the leadership, but at the same time, respecting that this is a youth initiative, like that they want to have young people to be involved with the youth campaign. So like we have this youth campaign and we have the Vanuatu campaign, which are going side by side with the same objective, which is seeking climate justice. And climate justice is not only having a piece of paper written and telling that human rights are being affected by the climate change, no. Climate justice is further, is, is more than that. It's also talking about equity. It's talking about uh, the damages that have been done, the loss of biodiversity and nature. It's all a part of that. And we really hope that in the, in the court's advisory opinion, these elements will come forward and also will be shown and will be known for all of the people. Um, so that's like a short, small overview on how it started back then. Uh, but you see, like in three years, we are, we're currently here. We're all around the globe. We came to the Hague. And you see so many people being inspired. Uh, two days ago and Sunday, we had a climate march in Rotterdam, they, in the Netherlands. There were 10,000 people hearing about, the, about this campaign. So it's growing and it's amazing. No, it's great because we are commemorating the 77th anniversary of the creation of the UN Charter in San Francisco. And yeah. uh, International Court of Justice is the principal legal organ of the UN. So as you're sharing, yes. it's really a moral and legal call to urgent action by the youth. And it's a great partnership to see youth from Oceania coming together yes. with countries. And Vanuatu has such a legacy of standing yes. up for self-determination for West Papua and always yeah. working for Pacific Islanders. And I think that's the main point they're bringing. There's a certainty, there's a clarity, but they're like, we fought so hard for our independence and we yeah. have this right of self-determination. And this case, if nothing else, is an example of self-determination and that right under international law. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the thing, Joshua. I think that that self-determination element is so important because people often tend to forget that um, the self-determination of peoples is, is, is one of the most basic human rights. And especially when we discuss this, people always tend to think that this is a very new notion, but it's not true. Actually, back in the, in the 1600s or the 1700s, when Grotius was the inventor of international law, you already had Spanish scholars, legal scholars, telling that all indigenous peoples had their own actual claims on land, their own rights, and their own self-determination. But then we came in with the Western colonization, and we took it all away from them, and we set them back a couple hundred years. And right now, you see the same happening in forms of neocolonialism by corporations or by uh, large multinationals. So what we're trying to say is, at the same time, it is also at the core of this ICJ advisory opinion that we tend to, to let the people that are suffering from it to be at the core of it and let them speak first of all. Um, and that's why we are really focusing on them to be present at the court, to let them be vocal, to let all of the world know that this is a case of the people by the people and not despite them. That's a great point. And as we're closing, I know what will happen next after this global gathering here at the Peace Palace, where we have the upcoming UN General Assembly in September? Yes. And yes. then there's the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change COP27 hosted in Egypt. How can people around the planet participate and be part of this powerful campaign and process for positive social change and climate justice? Thank you so much, Joshua, for this amazing question. So first of all, uh, people uh, can become a friend of the initiative. So I would recommend everybody to go to uh, wy4cj.org, which is our website. And you can check out uh, numerous of ways on how to get involved with the campaign. You can start your own local front, your own, you can join a local campaign. And you can also write to your representatives, write to your senators, write to your government officials about this campaign, about this upcoming vote, because it is at the end a vote that is going about all of our lives together. So they need to recognize our human rights. And I would recommend for all to like that are currently looking at this and are inspired by it is just sign, send us a DM on Twitter or Instagram, doesn't matter. We'll get in touch with you and we'll get you on board because in the end, we're taking the world's biggest problem to the world's highest court 
together. And we'll say, AO, let's go. That's right. So AO is advisory opinion. Let's go. It's to the Hague, to the Peace Palace, the International Court of Justice. One final thing. There does have to be a vote at the UN General Assembly, and Vanuatu is yes. leading that. So our main yes. goal then, as we get in our vodka, we're going to be sailing to New York first in September. And yes. how will that then move forward? Will there be a vote? Yes. So this vote will happen somewhere in the upcoming months. And uh, this vote will be uh, done, uh, will be held by a simple majority vote. So that means that we only need half plus one. And uh, yeah, so like, as I said before, it's not a question if, but when, and we seriously, we really believe this. I'm pretty sure, Joshua, you saw all the inspiring words and we see a lot of member states joining in and actively saying that they will vote in favor. Uh, so we're aiming for uh, an amount of upwards of 80, 90 countries, member states that are voting in favor of this resolution to seek for an advisory opinion at the international court. Uh, and I'm most definitely sure that we'll make it. And then the exciting part as we close is then those 15 judges will hear statements. Yeah, they will hear statements from the, from the peoples. And every, every, because it needs to be known, every member state has their own time slot at the court. So uh, the, the judges need to hear all of these stories. And our plan is during that, during that time period is to make sure that every member state puts forward young people and indigenous people at the table at the court because they are the ones which uh, it's with all about and not the others. Thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us after two grueling days at the global <laughs> level. And it's great to see your energy and look forward to continuing as we go forward and one day coming back to uh, celebrate here in The Hague after AO is completed and we go. So thank you so much, aloha. Thank you, bye-bye, have a good one. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.